Welcome to everyone as we gather together to worship on this fifth Sunday of Easter. And I pray that God is ble will bless you during this time. Uh, you can go to our website and uh, also you can, uh, as, as was done in the beginning, you can see where we can put in your prayer requests. We're just happy to have you join us here for worship. And so as we join together in worship, we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen. risen indeed. Alleluia. Um.
Good morning. Our first reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 16 through 31. Acts, chapter 17, verses 16 through 31. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him, as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and their devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know that this new teaching is that you are May we know that this new teaching is that you are presented? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling and hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. And as an as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead this is the word of the lord thanks be to god our second reading comes from the book of first peter chapter 3 verses 13 through 22 first peter chapter 3 verses 13 through 22 now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. 
the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter, verses 15 to 21. The 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 15 through 21. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the gospel of our Lord, and praise to you, O Christ. Now we're going to have a time of prayer together. Um, and again, you can please uh, email your prayer request in to Pastor B. Spang at Comcast.net. And um, we'll have time of general prayer right now, but if you want those included in our prayer list that we send out, uh, our elder uh, Bob, he coordinates the prayer requests and gets those sent out to everyone. It's a privilege to go before God's throne of grace. So let us go before him, our great God and Savior, in prayer. Father God, we praise you and thank you for this time together. We praise you and thank you for the gifts of life. We praise you and thank you, Lord God, that you have redeemed us and bought us with the precious blood of Jesus. We praise you and thank you because he lives, we also shall live. We know that neither death nor, nor, nor demons nor angels nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love that you have for us in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. To you alone bring glory, to you alone be honor, Lord. We lift before your throne of grace this nation of ours, Lord God. Our heart goes out to the people that are suffering at this time uh, through this terrible virus. We pray for a squashing of this virus, Lord God, that it would just go away by your uh, magnificent power, Lord God, that you would show yourself to your glory and shine on us, Lord God. Be merciful to us. We pray, Lord God, for wisdom and guidance for the doctors and the nurses, for those who are working so diligently and so hard, Lord God, to bring about a vaccine. To those who are looking for treatments, Lord God, we lift them before your throne of grace and ask, Lord God, that you would give to them the discernment, the knowledge, the wisdom that they need. We pray that we would humble ourselves before you as a nation. We pray that our leaders would work together, that they would put aside their partisan bickering and, and, and hurting of each other and come together to help this nation, Lord God. We pray that all the leaders uh, would humble themselves and look to you for we need your wisdom. We need your guidance in our lives, Lord God. Lord, we pray, Lord, during this time that people would cry out to you, would look to you. We pray for healing for the land, not only a physical healing and a healing from this virus, but a healing from the sin that so deeply infects our nation and infects each and every one of us. Lord God, may we turn to Jesus who, uh, who bought us with his precious blood, who because he lives, we also shall live. So we praise you and thank you for that. Lord God, uh, all of what we pray for, we entrust in your, to your hands. We pray that you would give us the faith to release our grip on everything place it at the foot of the cross, and trust everything to the nail-scarred hands of Jesus our Savior, who has taught us to pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh 
again for joining us and today's message is going to be based on our text from 1st Peter chapter 3 verses 13 to 22 1st Peter chapter 3 verses 13 to 22 and it's part of our born again series born again by the word and by water so uh, let's have a word of prayer together gracious father as we dig into your word we pray that your spirit be present with us you would open our hearts and minds to you, that we would not just gain head knowledge, that we would be transformed by the power of your spirit, drawn closer to Jesus, and see, see what it means to be his follower in the midst of uh, all we're going through right now, uh, that you would use us in any way that you see fit, that we would be your ambassadors. So we pray that you would be present with us now, teach us, and draw us to yourself. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So... One of my favorite Christian speakers is Ravi Zacharias, and uh, he, he's certainly a, a, a man that has dedicated his life to the preaching of the gospel. But what you might not know is that Ravi, as a young man, was a very, very conflicted, and despair had come into his life, and he actually tried to take his life at one point by uh, drinking some poison. And as he lay in that hospital bed, a Christian worker brought in a Bible for him and told his mother who was there to read to Ravi from John chapter 14. And so that was today's gospel reading. Part of John chapter 14 was today's gospel reading. And the verse that stuck out in Ravi's mind and was instrumental in changing the course of his life as he was laying on that hospital bed after trying to poison himself was the words of Jesus when he said, because I live, you also will live. That changed the course of his, of his very life. And he went on to preach the gospel all over the world after that. Uh, he has come to, since I've been here in State College, he's been to Penn State two times. What you might not know also is that um, he deals with a lot of pain. He's dealt with a lot of pain over the years, especially a lot of back pain. What I am very impressed with, though, in when he comes and he preaches in various places, including hostile places like a university setting like Penn State, he uh, is very gracious in answering people's questions, no matter what the question, uh, how it's slated, and even no matter how hostile it is, as you can imagine, sometimes very hostile in a university setting. Um, living, though, the lifestyle of an itinerant preacher is not an easy lifestyle to live at all. Imagine being on the road constantly, the time demands on you. They're constantly having to be on the top of your game. People are going to ask you the hardest questions. They're saving up the hardest questions for Ravi Zacharias to try and answer. Constantly on it, not being at home, not having the home cooked meals, all of the stress that goes along with that. On top of that, as I mentioned, for years he has struggled with intense back pain. Recently, while he was being treated for back pain, they discovered he has cancer. Not just any cancer, but an aggressive bone cancer in which they have run out of treatment options for him. So unless the Lord miraculously heals him of this, Ravi probably does not have much longer on the face of this earth. He will be with his Lord, though, and he knows that. That is his pilgrimage. His pilgrimage here on the earth may soon be over. The words of St. Peter, I think, ring especially true for the life of a person like Ravi, where it says in verse 13 from chapter 3 of 1 Peter, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Let that sink in for a little bit. Hardship and suffering for doing good. Not only has Ravi dealt with physical hardships, 
but he also has had to deal with the attacks that inevitably come when you are a world-renowned Christian speaker. There is nothing more than some people would like to bring him down, to find some controversy in his life that would undermine his ministry in some way or another. Peter's words certainly ring true for Robbie, but they also ring true for us as well. We may not be world-renowned Christian speakers, but we are known by our family, by our friends, by our co-workers, by people we attend university with or, in, or to attend school with. There are many people that we interact with that know us. And it says again that in verse 13, that now no harm's gonna to come to you if you're zealous for what is good. Zealous for what is good. I have to admit to you, I don't think I can apply that term to myself. Not all the time, for sure. Because it's not as if like I'm, you know, zealous for doing evil or my thoughts are on evil. It's just that my thoughts aren't always on doing good. I'm not zealous, really zealous at the core for doing good. What is more likely to occur is not good thoughts, zealous for doing good thoughts or, or, or evil thoughts, but is simply being occupied with the priorities of this day. That becomes the, the first and foremost in my thoughts and in my mind, the events of the day. What needs to be taken care of right now? What needs to be happening right now? And I think that I miss many opportunities for doing good simply because I'm preoccupied with what I think I need to have done right now. The next thing on the list. Maybe in this way, COVID-19 has taught me some things. To see things a little differently. What is really important? What really matters? The other day I was out spreading some grass seed on an area of our lawn that doesn't, it doesn't have any grass growing on it, it needs a little grass seed. So I was out spreading some grass seed and my neighbor was walking past, walking the dog, and he said, hi Brian, how are you doing? And I said, fine. And I gave the obligatory response, and how are you doing? And he said, not so good. And he stopped, and I looked up at him and he said, my 90-some-year-old father has COVID-19 and is dying right now, lives outside of Philadelphia. You see, he needed to talk to somebody. He needed to stop. We had an opportunity then to talk for a while and to pray together. What is really important? What really matters? Peter goes on to say this, but in your hearts honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. You know, most encounters that we have with people, at least what I have with people, don't require an elaborate defense of the Christian faith. Granted, Ravi Zacharias going into university settings many times requires elaborate defense of the Christian faith. People are going to ask you the uh, brain-twisting questions. But most encounters will be like the encounter I had with my neighbor. No hostility, just a person who's hurting, who needs some hope in their life. A reason for the hope. To have, to have reason to have hope in their life. And that's when we, as followers of Jesus, need to be ready to give people the reason for the hope that is in us in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of things, and yes, even in the midst of death. In most cases, 
I haven't had things raised to the level that Peter talks about, where opposition grows and hostility grows. As he continues on in verse 16, he says, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And so I think we should consider ourselves blessed and fortunate that we live in a, at a time and in a place where for the most part, we're not under constant attack for our Christian faith. We, for the most part, don't encounter direct mocking and opposition, direct to our, to our faith. It may be on the side, we may hear about things, but usually not directly. In verse 18, Peter goes on to say, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So, if we do suffer, if we are mocked, if we are looked down on, it is good for us to remember that Christ suffered for the unrighteous. Who are the unrighteous? Me. You. Christ suffered for us. He suffered for us while we didn't care one iota about God. He suffered for us. This is a great thing that God has done for us. And if we keep our eyes focused on the cross, it brings a humility and a humbleness to our life that we begin to see others through the eyes of Jesus. Not as somebody who has put us down and mocked us and so we're all upset in our narcissistic tendencies of wanting to defend ourselves and have to be number one all the time are put aside and we begin to see them through the eyes of Jesus. Because God's desire is not only to, to save you, not only to save me, to save all people. So we have this short time here on this earth, and God has brought us from a kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He's done all this for you. Continuing on in verse 19, Peter says this, in which he went and proclaimed, that is, Jesus went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So Jesus, there's some remarkable things that Jesus has done for us. First and foremost, of course, he journeys to the cross for us and takes upon himself our sin, and in which he cries out from the, cr the cross, my God, my God, why has you, how, has thou forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? In other words, he's experiencing hell. He's experienced separation from the Father so that you and I would never have to experience separation from the Father. But then after he dies on the cross, we proclaim in the creed that he descended into hell. Well, what's that all about? Because he said on the cross, it is finished. That is not a further punishment on our behalf. That is another, not a further judgment on our behalf. It is Jesus who is going to proclaim his victory to those who are captives, to those who have rejected throughout the, the, the time of all of history what God has done. When God is crying out to them to turn to him, and they time and time again reject and say, no, I don't want any part of you. As it was in the days of Noah, when upon the whole face of the earth, there was only eight people that were saved. Only eight people 
that entered into that ark. And then the great fountains of the deep were, were broken open and, and all kinds of water and other things are spewed into the atmosphere and come raining down 40 days and 40 nights of intense destruction on the face of the earth in which the earth is covered. And eight people are brought safely through in that ark. And Peter says, baptism corresponds to this in which you were brought maybe as a baby, maybe as an adult, to that baptismal font, the ark, and the waters were parted for you and sprinkled upon you. And God said, you are mine. I have brought you through. You were buried with Christ at that time, drowned with Christ and raised to newness of life in and through Jesus, in which he has placed his mark on you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, you're mine, and I love you with an everlasting love. You are adopted as his own. Baptism, Peter says, now saves you. Not as a washing of dirt from your body. We've got to constantly do that. But the one time in which you're brought to these saving waters of baptism, in which God has said, I love you. I've adopted you as my own. I've brought you into my kingdom. You are mine. And it says that we have been given this clean conscience now, not because we're sinless, but because he is sinless and his righteousness has been placed on you. Now it's not just, obviously it's not just water alone, because water by itself has no power, but it's God's word that says, this is what I've done for you. This is my love for you. This is my forgiveness for you. Come to the waters. Come and receive my grace and forgiveness. Come and receive a new life in and through Jesus Christ. Come, you have been born again and because we've been born again by water and the word, we can always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So my friends, as you go about your week, with all the unknowns that we have, know this for certain. You have the sure and certain reason for the hope that is in you. You are loved with an everlasting love in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we come into your presence acknowledging that you are a great and mighty God, awesome, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Thank you for adopting us into your kingdom. Thank you, Lord God, for the waters of baptism that we can go back to and remember time and time again when the devil wants to put doubt in our, in our hearts and our minds, we can remember that you have loved us, given everything for us, washed us and cleansed us, Lord God. Thank you for the grace and mercy found in Jesus Christ, our Savior. In his name we pray, amen, amen. Let us confess together our faith in the triune God and all he has done for us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We have a, a time of confession before the Lord, and the Lord knows what's really on our heart, but what he's inviting us to do is come before him, be honest before him, come into his presence, uh, don't hide anything from him. Run to him. It's a mistake for us to run from God. We should run to.
towards him and confess to him. So let us, let's open our hearts and our minds to him. There'll be a time of silence as well that we can really pour out our hearts to God. So from the words uh, from, the, from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment in silence to reflect upon our need for Christ. So, Lord, let us confess our sins to God, our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the gift of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today, and it's just a joy to have you joining in with us. And you have been born again by water and the word. You've been adopted into the kingdom of God. May God's blessing just shine upon you. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Oh,